Well, hello there, everyone. I'm CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Saturday and would be happy to have you join the family. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's recap and discuss the 17th episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. <laughs> Wow, we you guys. This episode was a good one. I just want to say how cool everyone was who came out to the theaters and saw our favorite nerdy ass voice actors in action again. Everyone was so nice and they were really polite to the wait staff, and that was what was really cool. It's truly amazing to experience it in theaters, and I really recommend it. It's also just so cool to see that, like, in the smallish area I'm from, Critters came out in droves for this amazing episode. We open on Imogen, purple crystal in hand, finding herself facing the giant red storm once again. Her mother's voice reaches out and tells her to run, just like she's used to. But the glowing violet object feels like a sanctuary, and Imogen fights hard to ignore its enticing call to welcome her home. When she awakens, she speaks with Laudna about what happened. And they share this really sweet moment where Laudna asks for her to hold her hand the next time so that if the nightmare takes hold once again, maybe she'll be there for her in the dream, just like the crystal had been. We do find out the origin of the crystal. It's a small piece of a fey object called the Gnarl Rock. A strange phenomenon seems to occur around it that corrupts and changes the things that it is near. Did the Nightmare King break off a piece of it to use for his experimentations? Or is he perhaps the creator of the strange thing that not many know the beginnings of? The morning arrives and we hear the regretful howls of Chetney sleeping in potentially shake the blooming relationship between him and Fern. The crowd was dying at her comment of, Just wait, I'll make my way through all of you. After breakfast, the bells hells, still undetermined if we should add the the, go and speak to Gianna Hexum and are tasked with her petty mission of stealing an item from a rival collector in a show of muscle. They encounter a strange statue that is the nice friend of the group that lets you know that you have broccoli in your teeth and also learn the mysterious package that Dorian's hot brother was accused of stealing. Gianna had an automaton of her own that was made to protect her and it was taken. And the woman takes great interest in our favorite flask, FCG, because of it. She did reveal that fresh cut grass could fetch a pretty penny as the one she paid for was over 25,000 gold. That's right, thousand gold. Damn, if we have a role like Marisha does at the hops table in Atlantic City, we should be set with that handsome cash grab on our arms. After being given their mission, the Hells split to prepare for the upcoming journey to the Hartmoor. Chetney threatens to eat Imogen's favored terrain, horses. Ladna and Fern steal cookies and have a gal pal session with Big Papa Estheros updating him about the Green Seekers and the Shade Mother. And Orem joins FCG and Ashton at the Crook House, where fresh cut grass is patched up and updated by Milo, who uses their weird mechanical engineering expertise to make it easy for our favorite robot to switch out his different hand accessories like he's a Polly Pocket. Gathering supplies, we finally step out of Drusar, which by the way, autocorrect changed it to Jesus, which makes me think that even Siri agrees that, Jesus, I'm so excited that we finally get to see more of this world and the heart more that we've heard so much about. I need to know about the crystal fauna and whether they are connected to Ashton. Yes, I do know that, like, you know, Fern had her whole thing where she tested what was Faye around her and Ashton didn't really ping anything on his spider, on her spider senses or whatever, but I still need to know. Our heroes do gain a couple magic items, 
a blue chromatic rose, which I like to think is sort of an homage to Yasha from Campaign 2, with her love of flowers and her connection to the Storm Lord. They also attacked the Easter Bunny and stole his shiny pink Easter egg, which will give us the little wild magic fun to throw in with Imogen's casting. I'm really pissed I used Marisha in the thumbnail last week, because her reveal was the biggest by far this episode. We find out around the campfire confessionals that Laudna was one of the Vox Machina lookalikes that the Briarwoods hung from the sun tree. I will say that one of the cool things about the theater experience is not only the green lantern glow and the rain perfect ambiance in that big theater, but the crowd slowly coming to realize what was happening at different times was so electric. The subtle gasps of people coming to know just like how truly fucked up what Laudna sort of lived through was, was just amazing. Who do we think she was? We can rule out Pike because of her age, but her human ears were cut to points for either Vex or Keyleth's half-elfness. In the original campaign, Matt said red paint had been strewn through the Keyleth's hair, that it wasn't actually red. How crazy would that be that she was potentially the embodiment of her Campaign 1 character all those years ago? Or what if she was Vex? Imagine what was going through Laura's mind finding out and knowing that essentially she's the reason Laudna died. Maybe the red paint is why Laudna wears red. Okay, I'm gasping at straws here, but you know like how deep it could go. It's, it's crazy. The Orem backstory reveal was so touching, and the entire theater was cooing. We finally learn of his departed husband, Will, who was killed during the assassination attempt on Keyleth's life. This whole time, with the anger and the Loomis twins, it was personal. And it's nice to finally have Orem open up a little bit to Chetney. He's been a little quiet and kind of, I don't know, I don't want to say like, to the wayside, but like... You can tell Liam's really letting other people have their chance to shine. This episode really made me love Orem and what a soft little baby he is. Yes, he has trauma, and so does Laudna. And it's really comforting knowing that they're both incredibly positive people, and yet have sort of had their lives stripped from them in a way. And oh my gosh, big moon, little moon, oh, so cute. The last bit of tantalizing information we learned was early on in the episode. Fern is searching for her parents, and they once sent her a postcard from Aeor. What the actual hell? Does that mean that they died with the rest of the Magic Society? Are they there now, and they're just traveling from ruin to ruin for, I don't know, information or sightseeing or whatever? Fern aged mostly in the Feywild. That means she spent nearly three or four hundred years on that plane. Time passes randomly, as we know from Vox Machina's experience with Vecna and Artagan. So does that mean maybe her parents left? And what has been that long for her could potentially be a shorter time on the material plane. Or maybe even a millennia, something a lot longer. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. And what the hell are they doing in Aeor? Do they have something involved with why FCG exists? Because we know that the automatons and Warforged of the world were kind of built there. And everyone's so bewitched and enchanted by fresh cut grass. And I don't know, maybe there's a little face something in there. I don't know. We'll find out, I guess. Don't forget to leave a like and check out my other side projects for more stuff to watch. Over on a pilot podcast, we just started reviewing movies and most recently discussed The Batman with the very sexy Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz. My friend Logan and I are also playing a Pokemon Diamond Nuzlocke over on Team Hyperfang. Also, I have music out. You can check it out literally anywhere you like to listen to your tunes. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Good day, my friends.